Welcome to the fourth presentation of the series of seven to celebrate Parsons 150th birthday. Tonight, Dave Maddox and I will be talking about sports and pastime in Parsons through the decades. As usual, Dave will start the process by giving us an overview of what's going on in the United States during this time frame and also what's going on in the Parsons area during this time frame. Dave? Okay, in the 19th, we're, our time is the 1930s, and we're doing, uh, in the 1930s, we are basically in the midst of the Great Depression. Uh, the United States Census, uh, there's 123 million people in the United States. Uh, in 1932, Charles, Lins Charles, Charles Lindbergh's infant son was kidnapped. Uh, 1932, Franklin Roosevelt defeated Herbert Hoover for the presidency. Uh, and then in 1933, the New Deal was passed, uh, bringing economic and social programs to help people out. Uh, 1933, the 21st Amendment ended prohibition. Uh, 1935, Babe Ruth retired. 1936 uh, was the Summer Olympics and Jesse Owens won four gold medals uh, in Germany. And in 1937, uh, the Hindenburg exploded in New Jersey, killing 36. And then in 1939, uh, we were on the brink of the war, but the U.S. had declared neutrality in World War II, but it was uh, happening in Europe. And so that's kind of an overview of what was going on in the United States in the 30s. In Parsons in the 30s, uh, in 1931, the Parsons Lions Club received their charter. 1933, uh, the expansion of the Fay Hotel. Uh, they opened a dining room and coffee shop in the adjoining building. Uh, in 1934, uh, the Payne Ratner home on East Main was completed. People know that as the governor's house. Uh, in 1935, the new McKinley School opened. And then in 1936, uh, Parsons received federal approval for a couple uh, PW PWA projects uh, to build the two swimming pools and the Marvel Park Stadium. In uh, 1936, we had the new fire and police building uh, and the junior college high school stadium was built. Uh, and then in 1938, Payne Ratner was elected governor uh, from Parsons. And then in 1939, the Orpheum Theater uh, caught fire and burned to the ground, and we had basically a, a hole in the ground for 15 years, so. All right, we're ready for the first slide. This is the Parsons Vikings uh, 5A State Basketball Championship uh, that they won in 1987. Uh, Parsons beat Blue Valley 70 to 65. Uh, the game was played in Emporia, uh, and Blue Valley was unbeaten and ranked number one in the state when Parsons beat them. Uh, they were coached by Terry Taylor, and just a quick uh, run through of the players who saw action in that game. Uh, Cortez White, Rob Barkas, Ray Staten, David Beard, Eric Williams, Don Kendrick, Brad Woodworth, and Kevin McDaniel. Uh, they had finished, Parson, the Parsons Vikings basketball team had finished as runner-up uh, in the state in 1984 and 1986 before winning it in 1987. And in 1987, they also won the Sportsmanship Award. Next slide. And here's a shot from the game. This is Ray State and scoring over one of the Blue Valley uh, players. Ray and Eric Williams both scored 19 points in this game. Uh, and basically, according to the Parsons' son, Cortez White changed the course of the game with the steal and layup to tie the score with three minutes remaining. Blue Valley was basically set to stall it out uh, and take the last shot, but uh, White stole the ball and tied the score. So. Next one. And this is the celebration after the game. Uh, Brad Woodworth, Eddie Lyons, Cortez White there, all are celebrating. Uh, 
And basically, we, we start out with this one uh, because uh, this is our first thing here because uh, Jack Harris, a longtime Parsons Sun sports writer, uh, basically ranked the basketball teams, in his opinion, uh, in 1993, he ranked the bas Parsons High School basketball teams, uh, the best teams, in his opinion, in history. And this team was ranked at the top. Uh, and I, I feel like maybe Parsons also won state championships in 1973 and 75. But they had, both those teams had really a couple of really good players there. And I feel like maybe uh, Mr. Harris ranked this team as the top team because it was such, it was scoring was so evenly spread out and maybe the best team. Uh, some of those other teams had, uh, like I said, really good players. He felt this was the best team in Parsons history basketball. And so talking about the, some of the earlier uh, state champion basketball teams, uh, this is the 1973 headline. Uh, this team was coached by Nick Devine. Uh, they trailed in the game twice by 12 points. And this was the first state championship. And in, in this team, Steve, or on this team, Steve O'Daffer was selected as the MVP of the tourney. Uh, he scored 83 points in the three games. Uh, and so the strange thing is, is this team, the 73 team, lost the first two games of the year and then came back and won the state championship. So and in 1975, uh, they also won the state championship uh, behind Henry Morton's 24 points, 22 rebounds. This team was also coached by Nick Devine. But because those two teams, 73 and 75, had those really outstanding players, uh, that helped their chances of winning quite a bit, so, okay. This is a picture of Dale Hall and his, one of his jerseys, number 88. Many people consider Dale Hall the finest athlete in Parsons High School history. He's arguably the best from the state of Kansas. Uh, he was first team All-State in basketball and football in both his junior and senior years, and he was his nickname was Special Delivery. I love that name. <laughs> he led the SEK League in uh, scoring in basketball and football for three seasons, and he's the all-time leading Viking scorer for career in both football and basketball. And here's a newspaper article about him where he's inducted into the KSHSAA Hall of Fame in 1993. And at several places during his senior year, announcers would say the score is Dale Hall, 21, the home team, zero. Okay, one high school uh, friend remembered his first time Dale set foot on a golf course. He shot a 42 at the Katy with borrowed clubs. So I think he was just a, a natural all-around athlete. He played football and basketball at Army, and he started uh, on the 1944 team, the unbeaten ranked uh, number one team, and he was twice All-American in basketball. Uh, and he averaged 23 points as a senior. Okay, next slide. Ah, here is a uh, mm -hmm. newspaper article about the 1960 Parsons Junior College National Championship basketball game. It was coached by Gene uh, Schickel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Gene Schickel. Um, it was Parsons Junior College 73, Tyler, Texas 71, and the game was played in Hutchison. Um, this was the uh, PJC's first trip to Hutch for a national tournament. And after the tournament, the director of the tournament had to issue an apology to the PJC coaches and the team and to the fans for what he called inappropriate and inadequate speech at the presentation ceremonies. Basically, he drew boos from the Parsons fans for stating that Parsons had been the underdog 
in every game, and with luck, not skill, but luck, they are champions of the national tournament. So as you can understand, the Parsons fans were not happy about the uh, underdog or just being lucky status. <laughs> and uh, let's see, do we have a tournament photo? Yeah, there's a tournament photo. Pictured is Bill Johnson, number 43, and Leonard Kelly, number 57. And these two uh, gentlemen are Parsons Junior College all-time leading career scorers. And they were both named to the all-tournament team. Okay, the next slide that we have is an early uh, Parsons High School football team. Uh, in the early days, the games were played at Forest Park, uh, basically played there just on a field that wouldn't have been any goalposts or anything. It was just a laid out a field. Uh, and they played there until uh, the Katy Field was built. Uh, the games at the Katy Field uh, played there from 1916 until the high school JUCO field was built. Uh, and everyone knows the junior college field uh, built was only 95 yards uh, and the games were played then on that 95 yard field uh, until the it was moved to Marvel Park. The last game played on the 95 yard field was October 30th 1971 uh, and then talk a little bit about a uh, couple of the coaches that were uh, high school Parsons high school football coaches. Uh, one that comes to mind Bailey Rickett uh, he coached Parsons High School football for 15 seasons, had several undefeated years, uh, was the all-time coaching wins leader until 1991, uh, was also head basketball coach for 15 seasons. Super successful guy, but you know you have to kind of preface that with uh, the fact that he had Dale Hall for four years there, and so maybe a little, <laughs> had a lot of wins, but maybe a little easier to get those wins when you have the best athlete Parsons has ever had. So like I said, uh, Mr. Ricketts was the all-time coaching wins leader in football until 1991. Uh, in 1991, Charlie and Allie passed uh, Mr. Ricketts as the all-time coaching leader in wins. Uh, in basketball, uh, if anyone would want to wager a guess who was the all-time wins leader, uh, you could just look at the name of the uh, basketball court, Her the Harold Johnson court. Uh, he's the all-time uh, wins leader in Parsons High School basketball. Bailey Ricketts is still second. Nick Devine is the third all-time leader. So uh, This is a, like we said, the uh, Parsons High School played at the Katie Athletic Field after it was built in 1916. Uh, the games were all played, as you can see there, it says uh, it's uh, in the afternoon because there were no lights. Uh, cost was 25 cents or 35 cents. Uh, and they also had some Legion teams that played there as well in football. Uh, and then this is, uh, this is the Katie Field. It was on the northeast corner, 25th and Durr. Uh, as I said, built in 1916 by the Katy Railroad, basically for the employees' use and for the uh, a big meet or athletic meet that they had uh, once a year that was awarded to a city on the Katy line, and Parsons had it several times. Uh, the grandstand was covered in seated 2,000, as you can see there in the middle. And then there were bleachers on each side uh, that seated about 6,000. And then they had a fence so that spectators couldn't get onto the field, which apparently was an issue. So, uh, And this is then the dedication. Uh, it was dedicated September 2nd, 1916 with a baseball game and a small track meet. Uh, the Katy Band played and they had new uniforms there for that. They had, had a formal flag raising before the track meet. Uh, at the northeast corner of the field uh, were boxcars that had been converted to showers for the competitors. Uh, by the 1930s, the Katy Field was being used as a practice field only and had fallen into disrepair. Once the field uh, behind the 
new junior college high school that's now the middle school. Once that field was done, uh, the KD field was kind of relegated to a practice field. And then in July 1942, the grandstand was raised and the field's 26 year, 26 year history came to an end. And a little bit about a couple, some of the early uh, baseball teams. Uh, the KD sponsored a lot of teams and this is one you can see the guy uh, the second guy from the left has a KD uniform on. Uh, this would have been pre-1920 baseball, uh, not any dugouts or anything. Again, they laid out a field and, and just went out and played the game. Lots of times no fence or anything. But the interesting thing about this is the dress of the coaches and fans. It's a little bit more dressy than nowadays. Uh, they got their suits, tie, and hats on. So, And the other thing that's uh, lacking today would be the cigarettes. Not unusual for the manager or the obviously the spectators, but probably not unusual for the players to light one up uh, when they're on the bench. So, and then this is a uh, 1912 full-page ad for an opening day, uh, just a just a city league uh, deal. And the Parson Sun sold spots to local businesses and I I really like this there is pretty clever uh, some of the uh, some of the ads are Lambert Duffy's saying they're giving away a free pair of shoes for the first home run hitter uh, I like this is my favorite one J.R. Rockhold who did short-term loan said you know if you guess wrong on tomorrow's game see me tomorrow <laughs> so uh, Parsons Street Railway, who wants to win in a walk when they can ride to the ballpark tomorrow on the Street Railway. And then Southwick Shoes, if your feet give you trouble so you can't watch the game, let us fit you to a pair of our custom-made shoes. So just a pretty neat ad there that you don't see nowadays. And then a little bit about Ban Johnson, the Ban Johnson League. It was a big deal in Parsons and similar to what the Babe Ruth League is nowadays. Uh, in 1933, the Ban Johnson League was formed in southeast Kansas, and it was for boys aged 17 to 21. Uh, the Legion teams were only for boys up to 17 years old, and they wanted something that guys could keep on playing if they wanted to up to age 21. So this league was established. Uh, Pat Dwyer, who was the owner of Club Billiards, was an early Parsons organizer. Uh, and the league featured these teams. They featured Independence, Coffeyville, Pittsburgh, Emporia, Chanute, Fort Scott, Parsons, and Iola. Uh, and for the most part, I imagine they took the train to these uh, to these games. So, and this is the 1939 team here. And some of the players on this team, and I, all I've got in the last names is Akers, McAtee, Dunley, and Sizemore. Uh, and the Ban Johnson League lasted in Parsons until the late 1950s. Well, it looks like we're switching gears, but we're really not. Uh, this is a, um, a postcard, I believe, of Parsons Business College, and it was um, most prosperous under uh, the direction of J.C. Olson, who purchased the Business College in 1898 and it experienced rapid and steady growth and Olson realized that one way to advertise the business college and to promote it was to sponsor sports teams. So he was very active and the Parsons Business College was very active in the community in terms of sports. They sponsored basketball, football, and baseball through the 1920s. Most of the time, Olson's Business College was located on the southeast corner of Central and Broadway. But in August 1914, Olson, along with four others from Parsons, had vacationed in Europe and were in Berlin when World War I started. And so locals were very concerned uh, that he would be able to get back safely. Okay, here's an example of a Parsons Business College team taken at the grounds of the state hospital. 
uh, and Professor Olson is pictured there, I believe, in the center. Yeah, it's pretty easy to see. He's yeah. the only one without yeah. a uniform on. Uh, the photograph is approximately <laughs> 1910. And early baseball games play, were played on open ground with bases laid out. And after the games, the collection was taken to pay the umpires and to help with the overall cost. And the next slide, please. Uh, here's baseball at the uh, state hospital, and pictured here is an early baseball game at, a state, at the state hospital grounds, and this is enlarged from a postcard, I believe. Yeah. The players in the foreground, as you can, if you look very closely, there's kind of a ghost image there, um, right in the middle of the card, right above uh, where the grass is and the dirt field begins, and that's because of early cameras. Uh, if people weren't just specifically and, and very uh, long term uh, still, uh, there would be multiple images, some of which are kind of ghost like there. And the bleachers in the field um, um, are there, as you can see, uh, for this baseball game. Okay, so the first, this is the newspaper clipping. Uh, when we got the first lights here in Parsons, uh, they were at the State Hospital Field in the spring of 1935. Uh, according to the Parsons Sun, there were 60 lights will make the field as light as day. Two tiers of six lights with 1,500 watt bulbs light the backfield and remainder directed at the infield. Uh, it sounds like it was plenty bright, but I'm wondering how easy it was to see the ball when you had a pop fly. But uh, before this, they had what they called a Twilight League. Uh, basically, they played uh, the games that started the games at 6 o'clock, so that way they could make sure the games were over with by the time it was dark. Uh, having the lights allowed them to move the games to 7.30 start time. It allowed people to go home, eat supper, and then go watch the game, as opposed to having to go directly to the field to watch. So they felt like that was a, a good thing for the crowd. Uh, the league consisted of, at that time, the City League consisted of uh, business-sponsored teams such as the Kimball Jarbo, Stewart's Drugstore, Kohl's Department Store, O'Brien Motor, the KAP, KEP, and the in one called the Hospital. And I still don't know I, whether that's Mercy Hospital or the State Hospital that just said it's, it was referred to always as the Hospital. So. By the 1930s, business sponsored uh, adult softball uh, also, and it was playing, usually they used the high school field. Uh, and one notable thing on the state hospital field, uh, June 6, 1949, uh, Mickey Mantle and his Baxter Springs team defeated the Parsons team eight to nothing on the state hospital field. So in less than two, three years, uh, Mantle was a starter for the New York Yankees. So kind of neat that he played at the state hospital and then a few years later uh, was in New York Yankee. Okay, we're gonna talk a bit about some of the early sporting goods dealers. Uh, and <clears throat> probably the earliest one is Ed Biro. And this is an advertisement for him. You can see he's at 111 South Central. Uh, <clears throat> in the late 1890s, uh, his store was located there. He later moved to Main Street and then back to Central uh, in his later years. Uh, the 1900 ad advertisement reads, the largest line of sporting goods in southern Kansas. So whether he actually had that or he just was like to tell people who had it, sounds like a pretty good store. Uh, he also sold in that store books, Bibles, and fireworks, which I thought was an unusual assortment of things to sell. Uh, and he did sponsor teams for many years. Uh, I've seen lots of pictures with Bero, B-E-R-O, across the front. So I know he was a big sponsor. Uh, and his store was, as were many of the early sporting goods stores, they were the place to go to talk and gossip about sports and local news. This is another uh, newspaper clipping talking about what the Bureau sto store was. Uh, in 1909, which is when this clipping was from, uh, the World Series was featuring a Parsons product. 
uh, Babe Adams pitching for the Pittsburgh Pirates in Game 7. And so basically, you don't have TV or really radio then, so people have to hear th the game somehow. Basically, they ran a special wire into the second floor of Bureau's store at 107 South Central, <clears throat> which is now Great Southern. And one man would read the ticker to Ed Biro, and he would repeat it out the window. And basically, uh, several hundred people gathered on the sidewalk and spilled out into the street in front of a store to hear the game. Uh, they remained there the entire length of the game, uh, cheering when things went well. And the one thing in the newspaper said that the police only had to be called once to make the crowd get out of the street. So that was a pretty, pretty good deal. So anyway, interesting to how that, that many people would come, that you would have uh, basically several hundred people willing to stand out there for three hours and listen to the game. And the, the Pittsburgh Pirates featuring Parsons product, Babe Adams, did win the game and did win the World Series. And so that's, what, that's who this is right here. Uh, this is Charles Babe Adams, and he played in the Missouri Valley League with the Parsons Preachers in 1905. Uh, their home field was Glenwood Park, uh, and he was basically discovered by Ed Biro. Uh, Mr. Adams was from Caney, Kansas, and he was working there uh, for a farmer earning $20 a month, and uh, Biro heard that you know, he was a good player, had a good arm, went over there, basically offered Babe Adams, knew he was making $20 a month, he offered him $30 a month to come to Parsons and pitch for the preachers. And I guess the rest is history, came here and did really well. Uh, when he did come to Parsons, uh, one uh, account said that he had a flaming purple baseball uniform that he insisted on wearing in his first game in Parsons. And so I guess they let him wear it, but only for the first game. <clears throat> After the 1905 season, Babe was sold to the St. Louis Cardinals for $500, and then they sold him to the Pittsburgh Pirates. And as I said, he won that seventh game in the World Series in 1909, but the neat thing about it is not only did he win game seven, but he won two other games in the same World Series. He won three of the four games the Pirates won in the World Series. Uh, that will never happen again because they won't let pitchers pitch that much. And, you know, but, but pretty neat that a guy was, that was pitching in Glenwood Park in 1905, four years later, was uh, throwing his third game and winning his third game in the World Series for the Pirates. Okay, the next guy we're going to talk about as far as sporting goods dealers and promoters of sports in Parson is Ed Ration. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, my voice seems to be <laughs> going through puberty, I guess. <laughs> uh, He's he, the one in the center again, yeah, I guess. Okay. Yeah, you can always tell the coaches slash sponsors are the ones that are dressed nice. Uh, <clears throat> Anyway, he sponsored athletic teams and events through the years. Uh, he was in business in Parsons from 1910 through 1936. And he sponsored, this is a basketball team. He sponsored basketball teams, sponsored baseball teams. Uh, he was uh, really into golf. And in the 30s and 40s, the Ration Cup was uh, a large trophy that was given to the best golfer at the Katy Golf Course every year. So, next one. And this is an early ration ad. This is a 1914 uh, ad. Uh, his first store was at, uh, opened in 1909 at 115 South Central. And originally he sold cigars and tobacco. Uh, later the store carried a, you know, his, it seems like sporting goods stores, like they weren't satisfied with just that. He, he carried cigars, he carried pipes, he carried rifles, pocket knives, flashlights. Uh, guns and ammo, cameras and supplies, thermoses, that type of stuff. So, next dad. And this is another uh, ration advertisement uh, when he remodeled the store in 1919. 
and basically changed his focus more to sporting goods. He was still at 115 South Central, uh, but this one says, improve your health, your morale, and your sportsmanship. Uh, and he carried baseball and fishing gear here. Next one. And then this is an ad for uh, uh, a basketball team that Mr. Ration sponsored. Uh, it's a, this one's in 1921, and it's Rations versus the Kansas City Federal Reserve Five. Uh, so apparently they just rounded up other sponsored teams and would, you know, take turns going to the other team's home court and playing. Uh, this one is urging fans to go and pull for rations. Parsons own five. They're fast and furious. Uh, in May of 1925, rations moved to the Kimball Building at 18th and Main, which is right across the street from Bleacher Gear uh, there. And finished out his career in 1936 at 113 South 18th. And then the last uh, sporting his dealer we'll talk just a bit about is Harry Edwards, and people probably remember him. Uh, he opened in 1936. He announced that he would open a sporting goods store at 1813 Main, and that's where he did open, and that's where his store remained. Uh, he had worked for Mr. Rash and for the previous 14 years, and when he went out of business, uh, Harry Edwards decided to open up his own store again. As you can see, some of the advertise or some of the things that he, the items that he has for sale there, uh, sporting goods, news publications, tobacco, and cigars. Uh, and the 1813 main location was really a very narrow store. Uh, it was almost like a hallway. Uh, Edwards had graduated from the Parsons Business College that we talked about just a little bit earlier, uh, and he loved sports. And he had played on several of the old KD baseball teams. He'd played on the old independent basketball teams. And he had played on an American Legion football team in Parsons. So the store was never air conditioned and was known as the place to go by all the male loafers in town. Uh, again, just a place to sit around. You could smoke a cigar, uh, gossip about sports or what was going on. Uh, the store remained, as I said, uh, 1813 Maine from 1936 to 1971. Uh, th that's where a store was, uh, and it closed and was torn down in urban renewal in 1971. <clears throat> Here's a, a photograph taken right before urban renewal that uh, highlights what many people remember as club billiards. When I first moved to town in 1975, I heard lots of stories about club billiards and uh, what all went on there. Uh, mostly just fun things, yeah. but, but uh, uh, it was a very popular spot. The history is a little more complicated, however. Uh, Pat Dwyer played minor league baseball for several years and served in World War I. And after returning to Parsons, he opened a billiard hall in the Matheson Hotel. After a few years there, he opened Club Billiards in 1923 at the old First National Bank building, which is the uh, red brick building with the white stone trim there that you see located on the corner of Central and Broadway. Unfortunately, Dreyer died of a heart attack in 1940, and I think in the building? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. in Club Billiards. Mm -hmm. Uh, and a, an employee, Lou Moriarty, became owner from 1940 to 1968 when Club Billiards closed. And you can see the proximity of Club Billiards to the Katy Depot there in the background. And that's the Fay Hotel, is that correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah the, the tall building in the yeah, background. Yeah, the tall is the Fay <clears throat> and then the, the Katy Depot. The name Club Billiards was purchased and a new building was used until 1977, but then it closed and there was an auction to disperse of all the items. At the, at the presentation, uh, Kenny Irvin was there and Kenny's a longtime Parsons guy and he told the story that when he was young, him and some of his friends paid one of their buddies to ride a horse through the front door of the deal and the Mr. Moriarty chased him out and told him to never come back. You, you just don't get that kind of thing out of the newspaper. You, you got to have that guy that's actually lived it. So, 
And that's some of the stories that yeah. I had heard over yeah. the years. Here's an ad uh, from Club Billiards. And as uh, you suspect, it was a gathering place for, for men and Parsons. There were drinks, pool, billiards, <clears throat> cigars, and people talked sports. The walls were covered with pictures of athletic teams and local sports stars and memorabilia. And I've seen some pictures. And uh, do we have that picture where it looks like the floor is really trashy? No, no. I, don't, I don't think we do. Yeah. We have a, one picture, and it looks no. like they need to sweep the floor. But anyway. <laughs> yeah. I don't think uh, cleanliness was up on the list, list of, <laughs> of uh, at club billiards. Uh, it was known to most people as just the club. Basically, it was, even though it wasn't a, a stated rule, it basically was off limits to women. And when Parsons teams went on the road, they called the scores into the club and they were posted and professional team scores were also posted. So you could keep abreast of, of uh, the scores for ball teams while you hung out at the club billiards. In the 1940s, after World War II ended, a soldier gave the club a captured Nazi flag to display. And as servicemen came back to Parsons and visited club billiards, they were encouraged to write their names on it. And at one time, there were more than 100 names on the flag. And next one. Ah, here's an aerial view of the Parsons Country Club. According to the Parsons' son, quote, it is a roomy, restful-looking house that crowns the hill nearly 100 feet above the stream. And the stream they're talking about is Little Labette Creek. A concrete dam was built across the creek and gave it a depth of three and a half to six feet of water for boating, swimming, and fishing at the country club. The country club had its own light and water plants, and they were run with gas engines. J.F. Steele, who was president of the commercial bank, was also president of the country club and $10,000 worth of stock was sold in the corporation when the uh, country club was formed. And if you're wanting to know, get acclimatized to the, the photo, that's Main Street that's at the very top, kind of angling across the top, and then the road going straight across behind the country club, that's Lion Road. So, so basically, I think <clears throat> the house was about kind of where the swimming pool? It's right, that, that house now, they basically built the new country club, I believe, and I'll talk about that. They built it in front of it and then tore it down and made the parking lot. Okay. So. And this is a newspaper clipping uh, talking about the formal opening of the Parsons Country Club, June 5th, 1917. Uh, and. Another headline, entrancing view from the clubhouse. Uh, and then uh, the clubhouse served the community from 1917 until 1969. Uh, 1969, a new clubhouse was built, as I said, in front of it, and they tore that one down and made the parking lot there. Uh, at it cost $145,000 in 1969 to build that along with the swimming pool just to the east of the building. Uh, Bob Ewing was named manager. If, you, if you're if you familiar with sports in Parsons, Bob had a sporting goods store, uh, Bob Sports Center later on that I'm familiar with anyway, so <laughs> probably some other people are. Uh, in 2012, the country club was purchased by Great Life Golf and Fitness from Bill and Louisa Wiener who are at Wiener, who had purchased the club several years earlier. And then in 2017, Sterling Meadows at Parsons Golf and Fitness closed for good. It's now, <clears throat> it's now privately owned. I love the fact that it's entrancing. I know. It's, it's, yes. Things sounded, I always say that, things sounded so much better back then. Right. You live close by. <laughs> is it an entrancing view? You know, it kind of is sometimes. Okay. Other times, not so much. So. <laughs> okay. A little bit about the Katy Golf Course. This uh, photo shows the number nine green <clears throat> and the Katy sign uh, in July of 1928. Uh, this is commemorating the first hole in one made by G.P. Schlit Schlit Schlitler, hard name to pronounce. Uh, Good job. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I guess. Uh, you can see the Katy tracks and the train in the very background there. Uh, the 44 acre side of the golf course 
was like, as we said earlier, was built by the Katy Railroad. And then the dedication, uh, it was dedicated August 15, 1926. Uh, members of the country club were invited to the dedication and to play the course, which I thought was kind of a neat deal. Uh, probably hoping that they would also want to spend money there, but uh, the Katy Band was on hand and the Parsons Son, they said they mixed melody with golf balls. Uh, the original membership was about 150 people. Uh, the caretakers of the golf course originally lived in boxcars, converted to houses on the course. And I met a guy that came in and showed me his birth certificate uh, that was, his birth certificate said, Katy Golf Course, Parsons, Kansas, as the, date, as the place of birth. He was born in one of those, his father was a caretaker, and I thought that was kind of neat that he had that. Uh, in 1987, the property was purchased by the Katy Parsons Golf Club Association from the Katy Railroad for $75,000. And then in 2014, the present owners purchased the golf course from the association. Next, we're going to talk about another leisure activity, and that's swimming. And uh, before the uh, two public pools were built in the late 30s, the place to swim, oh, there were a couple of pay, pay you could pay to swim in a private pool, but the big place to swim was the YMCA swimming pool. The official opening of the new YMCA building and improvements on existing Existing, the existing building was 1917. The two-story addition contained the swimming pool. We don't have any color photographs of the pool, but uh, accounts uh, indicate that the elaborate tile work around the edges and on the sides and the bottom of the pool were a vivid uh, blue uh, on, a, on a white background. The addition cost $50,000. And uh, in 1917, there were approximately 400 members to the YMCA. And the YMCA was jointly owned by the city and the railroad. And for many years, uh, taught learn to swim classes. One of my favorite um, images in Parsons is of a parade in front of the Carnegie Library. And there's a float that goes by that is the uh, YMCA float and um, their float is basically a big round um, 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 stock tank full of water with kids in it swimming around to publicize the fact that uh, you could learn how to swim and there are little buttons in the museum's collection that say I learned to swim at the YMCA. Okay. Next, the two swimming pools here in town. Both of these uh, were constructed um, in uh, 1937 as PWA projects um, along with Marvel uh, Park Stadium. They were paid for by, the, by Parsons City Bonds for $110,000, I believe. The Forest Park Pool and Bath House is still in use, but the Glenwood Park Pool which was originally for black residents, and that bathhouse are, are now a part of the Arboretum. Well, the pool's gone, but... It's still there, it's just filled in. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's a really lovely flower garden. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> where the pool is. Um, uh, it's now the Arboretum, and the formal dedication of the two pools was June 9th, 1938. All right, this, we'll talk just a bit about uh, the Masons, this is the Masonic building. Uh, this was built in 1883 at the corner of Central and Washington. Uh, in 1907, Parsons had 20 different lodges. And just a few of the examples, I'm not going to list them all, but the Knights of Pythias, the RAM, which I think is the Royal Arch Masons, the AF and AM, the IOOF, which is the Odd Fellows, the AOUW, and the Coeur d'Alene. Uh, Commandery number 17, which was a Knights Templar uh, Lodge. Uh, in 1973, a new Masonic Lodge was built at the corner of 17th and Main, and it's still in use. And the one I'm 
most interested in, so the one you get to see pictures of, is the Knights Templar. Uh, this is a Templar parade uh, in 1908, and it's basically marching up central. You can see at the middle, right in the center there, uh, to the right-hand side is the uh, depot, the Frisco Depot, and then that's the Matheson Hotel that they're walking in front of. Uh, the Grand Commandery Conclave in Parsons, uh, there were 20 commanderies in full uniform on horseback in the parade, uh, and over 500 knights took part in the parade, and they had five bands, and according to the Parsons Sun, it was the greatest ever, so. And this is a early uh, little pamphlet uh, for a uh, reception for the Coeur de Leon. I really like the graphics on there. Uh, it's basically was given to attendees for a Knights Templar Coeur de Leon, uh, as I said, a little uh, get together they held, held in Parsons in 1902 at the Rasbach Hotel, which was just, uh, it was basically the Matheson Hotel. It was called the Rosbach for a few years there. Uh, and you can see the Templar cross on the night there and the fancy plumed hat. And we have some of those hats at the museum and uh, they're ostrich feather and they're in a display case and they have to stay in the display case because the Ostrich feather deteriorates so much that if you open that case there, and there you can see a better picture of the, of the hat. Uh, it gets all over everything. It's, it's a mess. So this is, uh, this is one of the Knights Templar in his, all in his uh, uniform. And if you want to see an actual uniform, as I said, you can go to the museum. We have the full uniform with the sword, uh, with the belt and the hat and everything over there. Uh, <laughs> Again, you can't touch anything because the feathers are coming apart. But uh, anyway, uh, pretty elaborate uh, deal, and they always dressed up in full regalia to do the parades and stuff. So, here's a picture of the. <clears throat> tell me how to pronounce. Athenum. Athenum. I can never remember how to pronounce <laughs> that. The Athenum Club in 1885. And it was organized here in town just two years before that in 1883. And this is an 1885 picture. It was an educational club for women. And one of the leisure activities for women at the time, especially in the uh, late 1900s, uh, were different types of clubs. Um, some clubs were founded for specific purpose and some were just general clubs. Um, there were dozens of clubs in town, but I wanted to mention a couple of them. Uh, there was the Mother's uh, Child Study Club, which was uh, to help with child welfare. There was the Mutual Improvement Club, which helped the YMCA. There was the Round Table Club, which helped uh, keep the soldiers' memorials uh, up and, and running. There was the Ruskin Club, which was promoted art in school. There was the Fourth Nightly Club, which was for child relief and specifically uh, at Garfield School. There was the Alpha Club, which this one is fascinating to me, for the conservation of birds. And um, uh, there's the Whittier uh, Club, which was for the study of Parsons histories, and Young Mothers Welfare Club, uh, which was for the welfare of young mothers. <laughs> okay, and next, oh, Adams Bluff. Here are some women picnicking at Adams Bluff. Probably a women's club or whatever. That was a popular meeting place. Right. It was a popular day uh, trip destination in the early 1900s. Uh, people picnicked there. They swam. Uh, they hiked. And there were very uh, soft shell banks. Uh, today, this, well, first of all, this looks like a very dramatic cliff. But today, I don't think uh, it's as sharp or as vertical because uh, it was soft shale. 
and over the years it has worn down a, a little bit. But it was named for the landowner, uh, Ira Adams, and that's on the southeast edge of Parsons, I believe. Yep. Yeah, and it was a popular spot for women, women's clubs and for picnics. Okay, we're, the, the category is sports and pastimes, and we've talked a lot about sports and pastimes. Now we'll talk a bit about an unusual pastime, uh, this photo, and then why don't you just go to the next one. Both uh, these photos are of Paul Hibbs, and his doodle bug. Uh, he it is a small airplane that he built at his home at 1614 Washington, basically that behind the, the Baptist church, the, build, the house is no longer there. Uh, but Mr. Hibbs was an office machine repairman and he worked out of a shop in his house. Uh, he started building this plane in 1929 uh, and as uh, the wings and things got too large. He moved it out to his yard. Uh, the Heath Company sold kits that you could order the whole kit. You could order the whole plane or you could order just parts and an instruction book. Uh, basically, he bought some parts from them. I don't know where he bought the instruction book. Uh, it said what he couldn't buy locally. He ordered from them. Uh, he worked on it as his pastime for on Sundays and in the evenings. Uh, and the engine was a four-cylinder Henderson motorcycle engine. Uh, and uh, again, Kenny Irving at the presentation remembered that his dad helped test this engine. He said he remembered it strapped to a tree and they fired up the engine. Uh, again, a, a kind of a neat first-hand uh, account. Uh, and then if you want to go to the next one, uh, when he got ready to, this is a clipping from when he was ready to try it out. Uh, the wings were made out of wood and muslin-like cloth, and they were coated with a waterproofing. Uh, and the first flight was June 29, 1930, and the doodle bug name was given to the plane by his wife. Uh, had a wingspan of only 25 feet, and the weight, including gasoline, was only 400 pounds, which is not very much. Uh, Mr. Hibbs took the plane apart and set it up inside the Masonic building to display the plane for the public. Uh, and he flew this plane at several events and sports, sports events around. If you remember in one of our previous deals, he flew the plane over the Katy Field before a baseball game and dropped baseballs out of it to see if people could catch him. So that was just, uh, yeah, yeah, we said that. Sounds like a lawsuit waiting to happen, but but that's what that's what they did then. So anyway, and it's a midget monoplane, which is really cool. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. <clears throat> oh, the Parsons Drive-In Theater. The gala opening for the Parsons Drive-In Theater was May 6, 1948, and it was yeah. uh, owned by Louis Stein. And uh, it's there, I think. One advertisement said, and you know how the, we've already talked about how the Parsons son always did a really good job of uh, describing things and sometimes embellishing Making things. Making it sound better. <laughs> yeah, embellishing. The advertisement said, never before in history has there been such a revolutionary change in theatrical entertainment. It's the biggest thing since talkies. It brings the glamour of the big city straight to you. Adult tickets for 41 cents. I know you don't like that, Dave. No, as a, as a retailer, <laughs> I, I can't understand why 41 cents would be the price. But Adult whatever. tickets for 41 cents plus tax yeah. in 1948. And I noted at the a live presentation a couple weeks ago that I think it's uh, kind of ironic that it, the ad talks about the glamour of the big city straight to you at the drive-in. And the very first feature shown there was Home in Indiana with Walter Brennan, which is <laughs> very, big city, isn't <laughs> not very big city, very folksy. <laughs> The drive-in closed in 1988 after 40 years, and the theater sign is now indoors at the Parsons Theater and was the inspiration for the outside <laughs> sign at the Parsons Theater as well. 
and then next, the Electric Park Theater. This, um, well, it looks like a ramshackled <laughs> conglomeration of wooden buildings. I think that's a good description of it. <laughs> but it's basically the Electric Park Theater, which was located where the college's student union is now, right across, uh, directly west of um, one of the main entrances to Forest Park. Uh, it opened in May 19, uh, May 19th, 1907, and it was only open in the spring and summer months. And uh, basically it was owned by a man named Charles Moorhead, and um, it was basically um, almost like a vaudevillian uh, venue. Uh, stock companies came, musical attractions that came through town played there, orchestras came in uh, to played music for dances. Prices were a dime and 20 cents. And in 1910, the Parsons Street Railroad made the Electric Park Theater accessible to all parts of town. So you could come from any part of town and there would be a stop there if you wanted to attend the Electric Park Theater. All right, and wrestling's a big deal now and wrestling's always been a big deal. Uh, at least in Parsons. So this is a poster, uh, Taz Rentrop versus Louis Apollo, uh, April 20th, 1914. And the interesting thing I think about the poster is it's at the Tabernacle on Corning. And I was interested to see, well, what exactly is the Tabernacle on Corning? So we'll talk about that in just a minute. Uh, as you can see, tickets were 50 cents each and the winner received the purse of $200 plus all gate receipts, which I wasn't sure what was in it for the people putting it on if they gave all the gate receipts plus $200 to this guy. But apparently that was, that's what it says. So uh, local referee Ike Van Meter. So a bit about the tabernacle on Corning. I got to look in to see, well, what was that? And basically it was constructed in 1909 just west of the Episcopal Church uh, on Corning. Uh, and they had to get an exemption from the city ordinance to build it because they wanted to build it mostly out of wood. And at that time, fire was a big issue uh, with wood buildings. And so they did get an exemption, even though a lot of people were unhappy about that uh, because it was in the downtown area and you didn't want to take a chance on once one thing catches fire, it's a tendency for other things to catch fire. So it had sporting events meetings and a lot of evangelical church events were there. Uh, it was sold in 1920 and it was dismantled. Uh, the wooden brick uh, used in construction of the building when they tore it down, they uh, used it to build several smaller houses in Parsons. So you never know, 1920, probably a lot of those houses would still be standing here. If you're living in one of those, your house could be uh, built out of uh, materials that they uh, reclaim from that. So, uh, and when they built the tabernacle, what brick they did use in it, uh, they used brick from the First Methodist Church that burned uh, in the early 1900s then. So, you never know, uh, lots of materials got reused and you never know exactly uh, what things got used where, so. Maybe it was the concessions that made them the money. It could be, I don't The drinks and the popcorn. Of, if you're given $200 and all the gate receipts, I just don't see how you come up with any money off of it, but uh, we'll, we'll never know, I guess. Uh, this is a, a photo of Buffalo Bill's show. And yes, Buffalo Bill's Wild West and Pawnee Bill's Far East show did come to Parsons uh, in, came here in October 7th, 1909. Uh, and they set up on South Central Avenue, probably somewhere down close to where Dayton Superior is, somewhere in that area there. Uh, there were 52 train cars made up the show. They carried 750 people and 500 horses. Uh, to put this show on. Uh, there wasn't a street parade, but it said people were lined all the way to the showgrounds to watch, uh, to watch them. Usually when the circus come to town, they would have a big parade 
uh, through downtown and everything just to kind of advertise and get all the kids wanting to go. Uh, this one, they just basically unloaded everything and took it, but people lined up anyway to watch. Uh, there were a lot of spectators from out of town. It was well advertised. Uh, I've seen banners and signs on po old postcards everywhere, so uh, they knew how to advertise it. And again, like Mike said about the uh, uh, Electric Park Theater, the streetcars uh, would take you from anywhere in town to basically right up to the show. There was a streetcar stop at 21st and Morton and another one at 18th and Appleton, so you only had to walk you know, a few blocks to get to where you were going. And then uh, it's another circus uh, that came through Parsons. This is the United Carl Hagenbach and Great Wallace Shows Circus. Again, I believe this one was set up, most of the time they set up down at the foot of Central, which would be somewhere in the Dayton Superior nowadays area. Uh, this was September 2nd, 1912. Uh, and I, I enlarged all those photos and look at the I looked at the circus banners there, and I know from watching uh, some of the American Pickers shows and stuff, those circus banners would be worth a fortune today if you had them. Uh, they're really cool. Looking. they got all kinds of wild animals on them and stuff. It's too bad I don't have them, but I don't. <laughs> so some of the circus, I'll just give you kind of a rundown real quick of some of the circuses that and shows that were in Parsons, have been in Parsons. Uh, the Sells Brother Transcontinental Tour, the Sells Flato Circus Menagerie and Hippodrome, the Barnum and London United Show, P.T. Barnum's Greatest Show on Earth was here, Four Paws New and Colossal Show, the John B. Doris New Monster Show, the Sells Brothers Greatest Show on Earth, this one I like, Senor Cortina's Spanish Mexican Wild West Show, uh, John Robinson Circus, and then we did have the Barnum and Bailey's Greatest Show on Earth was in Parsons, the Cole Brothers Combined Circus, and the Tom Mix Circus. All those circuses at some point in time in Parsons history were here. Okay, and this is gonna be our last slide of the evening. Uh, this is a little bit later. This is the Inman Brothers Daredevils. Uh, the Inman Brothers, Art and Don Inman, were from Coffeeville, Kansas and they started a little, they call it Flying Circus. Uh, this, uh, he, they did come to Parsons several times in the 1930s, and they would, if you wanted a ride, a lot of people hadn't ridden a plane then, by then, uh, they would take you on a six-seat airplane uh, for a cost. They did then, they had skydivers, they had free falls, uh, parade of planes over Parsons and airplane stunts. Uh, they had a lady uh, called Lady Redbird, and she did a double wing walk. Uh, and then they had Daredevil Dugan. Uh, he would do a 5,000-foot parachute drop, and I assume that means he would free fall for a long ways before he popped open his parachute. Uh, and then, so in one show in 1931, we everyone got a kick out of this at the presentation, uh, not wasn't really an airplane thing, but at one of their shows, two automobiles will collide at high speed in a head-on collision. <laughs> I guess that's entertainment. <laughs> so uh, anyway, if you wanted to go to this uh, in 1930, uh, your cost was a dollar per car car load of people, and if you wanted to ride the airplane. Uh, it would cost you a dollar to get on the plane and they'd give you a ride around Parsons. So anyway, I believe that's the end of the line.